to Oyster Catchers of the Word. Lord, we cry to you that you would put in our hearts that living faith that bears the wonderful fruit of you working for us in good works. This is a work of your spirit in our hearts. We pray that you would do this miracle here today in each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please take your seats. As always, with these passages set for today, the ones being, these being read all over the country and other denominations as well, there's so much to talk about, so many different things. That last passage, you could say so many things on that. But what I wanted to zoom into today was uh, a bit of that James 2 passage, because I wanted to talk about something that I have found very helpful in my own walk with God, in thinking about how believing and trusting in Jesus relates to our good works and relates to being accepted by Jesus. I'm just going to read again James 2, verses 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply the bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So in this passage, and in many passages talking about acceptance by faith, we're thinking about the question of how we come to God. A euphemism we hear sometimes is, go to meet your maker, prepare to meet your maker, or it sounds very daunting. And when we come before God, and this is what I have thought about many times, and being very afraid of the prospect, thinking, if I came before God, on what basis would he accept me? I know that I've done Many, many things in my life that I regret. I know that my thoughts are far from pure. On what basis could God accept me? If God, if, if, just just as a hypothetical situation, if, if God says to us, why should I let you into heaven? What do we say? What is our plea, let's say, before God? Well, I think some of the words from the Holy Communion liturgy can be really helpful for us here. I think it's one of the most profound and important prayers We say the whole time, we're going to say it a little later, and it's the one that says, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. Coming to the table is like a symbol of coming to God. So anytime we come to God, it's not on the basis of the fact that we are somehow righteous enough to do that. It's on the basis that he has chosen to be merciful to us, He's chosen to invite us there. He's given us the gift of life in Jesus. So we come to God by faith, by trusting in Jesus. And what that means is we look to Jesus, and when we think of how we can come before God, we think the reason I can come before God is not because of anything I've done. It's not because I go to church. It's not because I'm a basically decent human being, whatever that really means anyway. It's not because I'm an upstanding citizen or whatever that means It's not because I've done a certain quota of good works in my life. It's not because lots of people accept me. It's not because of any of those reasons. The only reason we come before God is because of what Jesus has done for us by dying for us and being raised again and us sharing in his life. When James, who is the brother of Jesus, who wrote this letter, that's the actual brother of Jesus, When he wrote this, he didn't contradict Jesus when Jesus said in John 3.16, in one of the most famous verses of all time, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Again, this says everyone who believes in him. And I feel Jesus does not say things that are empty. He means that everyone who believes in him It doesn't say everyone who believes in him and does this and this and this, these other hoops you have to jump through. It says everyone who trusts in Jesus 
and that's the reason we come before God, because of Jesus, he will not let us perish, but will bring us into eternal life. It's like receiving a gift of life. When you receive a gift, you can't say that you earn the gift because then it would be like a wage or a salary. If we're given a free gift by someone, all we do is accept it. Obviously, there's the possibility you could turn away the gift, and that's always the possibility. But all we do is we accept the gift that Jesus offers to us, open hands. And that's what faith is. And then this James passage, what it's talking about is how do we know if we're feeling uncertain about things? How do we know if we have received this gift of life? How do we know if Jesus has connected us to his life? Verse 17 is very interesting. I think we go, if you really look into this, I think it's actually very helpful. It says, so faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The idea of dead here makes you think of something living, like a plant or something like that. And that's the analogy that's used in many of the old confessions of faith. Did you know at the end of the Book of Common Prayer, one of the last things in here is the 39 Articles, uh, which were written in the 16th century, at the, basically when the Anglican Church first started in the English Reformation times. And this is what it says. Good works are the fruits of faith. And follow after justification, which is God's forgiveness of us. Cannot put away our sins. So it says, it compares them to the fruits on a fruit tree. The reason you know that the tree is alive is because it is bearing fruit. Our Presbyterian brothers and sisters have a very similar statement in their own Westminster Confession. It says that good works are the fruits and evidences of a true and lively faith. What's important here is not to confuse the cause and the effect. The cause of our acceptance with God is the gift of God given to us that we receive. The effect is that he changes our life. It's not that we change our life, then come to God. It's that we come to God and he does the work in changing us. Here is where I think a fruit tree analogy has been most helpful to me in trying to understand this. Now, I know not everyone is into illustrations, but this is an illustration that Jesus used. I thought it was worth bringing. And here I have a fresh branch from an apple tree. Went to get this this morning just down the road in Lowry Wood and got this fresh branch of an apple tree and here an apple out of the fruit bowl. What would be the difference between this and if I just sort of this plonking it in the earth like that and a fruit tree that was actually alive? What is the difference? And the answer is the fruit obviously the leaves as well, but the fruit, the things that grow on it. So you could paraphrase this whole passage, so an apple branch by itself, if it has no fruit, shows that it is dead. And what's very important to remember here is if you saw a dead branch being plonked into the ground like this, and you were thinking, I want that branch to be alive, you, what you could think is, I know, I need to make it look like an apple tree. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Tesco, get loads of apples, and I'm going to go to the garden center, get loads of leaves, and I'm going to stick them on with some really strong glue until this looks like a living tree. That's a bit like what we do when we try to be accepted by God by doing lots of good things. We're like sticking apples onto ourselves as though that's going to make God accept us. But the tree is still dead. It doesn't have any life. The only way this can have life is by it being fixed again into the tree, the source of life. And that's a picture for what faith is. It's like us being grafted into a tree, us relying, like a branch does, completely on that tree for all its life, all its support. And then the tree will then bear fruit by itself. And that's the way it works. I find that a very, very helpful analogy myself. Just as two other quick pictures, from the gospel passage, we had the stories of healing. And with those, and when Jesus heals people, this is very striking that he doesn't go up to them and say, I will only heal you if you do this and this and this to get accepted by me first. Or I won't heal you because you've done this and this and this wrong. Instead, he just goes to them in their need, simply because they believe in him. He says, by your faith, you have been healed, by you have been saved. So Jesus heals not on the basis of anything anyone has done, but simply because they believe that he will. 
And one last analogy. The other day, this week, uh, we heard someone shouting in the water from Groomsport Beach, and someone was stuck in the sea, it was much more rough than they'd expected, a swimmer. And someone had already called the Coast Guard. But imagine if the Coast Guard, and we saw the lifeboat came, the Coast Guard came next to us, saw where the person was, we tried to point out where they were, and they were really concerned. They were thinking, do we have to get a helicopter along? They were thinking the lifeboat can't come that far in because the waves are too big. But imagine if the Coast Guard turned around and asked me, does this person deserve to be saved? Does this person deserve to be rescued from the waves? No, the Coast Guard, the lifeboats, they wouldn't do that. Their only concern is to rescue the person. They don't care what the person's done. They just want to meet them because of their need. They have mercy on them. That's what it means to come to God in his mercy. He wants to help us, not because we deserve it, but because he has pity on us, because he sees us and he wants to help us. I think that's another great analogy. So what we can ask is that God would work in all of our hearts a faith that trusts in only him to be accepted. And we come before his table in a moment, not because of anything we've done, but only because of his mercy. And when we go to see him face to face, when he returns, or when we leave this world, we are received by him only because of his mercy. And that gives us great assurance that we don't have to worry about whether we've done enough to be accepted by him. If we believe in him, he will accept us. And we can pray that he will make that living faith bear wonderful fruit in our hearts. Let's pray that now. Holy Spirit, we know that you are the one who makes true faith in hearts. We pray today that we may give ourselves to you, that we may receive that fresh, that wonderful gift of life in Jesus, that we may look to you alone to be accepted by God, that we may look to you alone to come before your table and have a wonderful assurance that when we look to you, you will not, you will by no means turn us away. For you say, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We come to you, not on the basis of anything we've done, but simply because you are so willing to help us, to heal us and give us life. We pray that this living faith may bear wonderful fruit in our heart and in our world. In Jesus' name, amen.